Okay, welcome to the eighth lecture of the course on cyber physical system fundamentals. In this lecture, I will uh, teach again uh, embedded systems fundamentals of cyber physical system design. And uh, this uh, lecture is again related to chapter two of the companion textbook. That is the chapter which uh, covers uh, specification and modeling. Uh, today we will finish uh, that chapter, so this will be the last and final lecture belonging to that uh, chapter. Uh, the uh, topic of uh, this uh, lecture today uh, includes uh, the last uh, row in our table, in the table uh, describing the uh, structure of this chapter. And in addition to that, uh, I will also wrap up this uh, chapter. So first of all, I will talk about this uh, last row. This uh, last row, which uh, covers the imperative or so-called von Neumann model of computation, uh, where I, I will be covering uh, particular languages, languages that are using shared memory and that are using a message passing for the communication. So what is the imperative von Neumann model of uh, computation? Well, the imperative or von Neumann model is based on the principle of operation of von Neumann computers. And that means that we are thinking of computers that are using a sequence of instructions. And we are assuming that uh, normally we are executing the instructions in the sequence in which we have uh, written them into the computer or on, on, on a sheet of paper. So that means we are assuming a total order among these instructions and we are assuming that these instructions are executed according to that uh, total order uh, except for uh, possible branches. These branches are used in order uh, to implement uh, uh, conditional execution and uh, also loops and also we use them uh, to branch to procedures or uh, methods. Now, also from the von Neumann computer, we are inheriting uh, the visibility of uh, memory locations. We are inheriting the uh, rewritability of uh, variables that are just abstract views of uh, memory locations. And in many cases, unfortunately, we are also inheriting the visibility of addresses, which can make uh, life for the verification of uh, computer programs rather hard and which also is a source of uh, many errors. So based uh, on the principle of operation of von Neumann computers, we can use certain languages. At the lowest level, we have uh, machine languages, which uh, in this case I would like to understand as uh, languages where uh, the machine is actually programmed in binary. Well, obviously, normally we wouldn't like to do that, so therefore we are trying to raise our level of abstraction, and uh, initially we raise it just a little bit. We are using assembly languages where we are using certain uh, words, certain keywords, uh, that uh, allow humans to memorize uh, the uh, uh, names, to memorize names for the different operations. We can increase uh, that uh, level of abstraction significantly more by introducing higher level languages that provide uh, an uh, uh, abstraction of the execution on the machine. And these higher level languages include most of the languages that you know. They include C, C++, Java, etc. Now, if you look at this situation, you can uh, come to the conclusion that what has been used here is a kind of bottom-up process in that initially there was this von Neumann machine and then based on the principle of operation of the von Neumann machine, uh, the other languages were designed and the fact that we have uh, variables that can be rewritten an arbitrary number of times is, of course, inherited from uh, the properties of uh, memory locations. Uh, this uh, in, uh, uh, process uh, is also uh, um, observable in another context. It's observable in the context of uh, threads and processes. 
Initially, these machines were executing just a single program, but then it became obvious that it would be very convenient to implement an operating system that would allow uh, the context switching between the different uh, programs, and in that way it was easier uh, to use such machines by a larger set of uh, users. And also you could uh, use it for several applications at the same time. So therefore, operating systems uh, provided context switching between uh, different threads and processes. In many cases, this uh, context switching is based on preemption. That means the processor is taken away uh, from the uh, processes. In the context of embedded systems, so-called uh, cooperative multitasking or uh, time triggered systems would make some sense. That means that uh, processes would have to voluntarily give up the processor uh, or that you would have a timer that would uh, uh, force a context switch. Now this uh, concept, which initially was available just at the operating system level, uh, became uh, interesting to programmers as well, and they asked to get access to that feature as well. So that feature was made available to programmers. Now this uh, uh, results in the possibility to partition applications into threads, where uh, for threads I assume that they are executed in the same address space, or a pool of threads is executed in the same address space, uh, whereas processes are possibly executed in different uh, address spaces, and their communication with shared memory may be a little more difficult. Uh, so these uh, languages, which uh, were initially uh, designed uh, as a kind of bottom-up uh, process, as an abstraction of von Neumann computers, were initially not designed for communication and they were not designed for synchronization between various threads. But once this feature has become available at the application level as well, uh, synchronization and communication had to be added. And this also includes the availability of uh, access to shared memory. Now again, we observe such a uh, bottom-up uh, design process where initially a concept was available just at the operating system level, and now it's declared a feature which is also available uh, for the uh, um, uh, application programmer. Now with the access to shared memory, we are taking advantage of the fact uh, that uh, for shared memory we have a very fast uh, communication technique, because in that way we don't uh, need to have extra copying. We do of course need this extra copying if we are using message passing. However, uh, this availability of uh, the uh, shared memory results in potential race conditions. And we have seen that already on one of the uh, uh, earlier slides. Uh, just to uh, remind you of the problem that I pointed to, uh, we might have a situation where we have, say, two threads. And we have one thread where, first of all, we check whether a variable is less than 5. And if it is, we might increment that variable. And uh, from another thread, we could also access that uh, global variable. And we could set it to 5. So initially, a uh, programmer could assume that in this context, this variable uh, u could never have a value of 6. However, uh, due to the uh, uncontrolled preemption of processes, it could indeed have a value of 6, because there could be a context switch right after this test, and then we could execute that code, and then we could resume the execution over here, and as a result, uh, variable u would have a value of 6. So we can have these kinds of rather unexpected and, I would say, inconsistent results. In order to prune away these uh, inconsistent uh, results, we can uh, define uh, so-called critical sections, which are sections of code at which uh, mutually exclusive access to shared resources, and in particular to shared memory, uh, can be guaranteed. 
Now we have already seen uh, the possible application of the corresponding primitives also on this earlier slide. We can take advantage of uh, so-called semaphore operations. Semaphore operations will allow us to check whether we would get exclusive access to the shared resource and we would wait in case uh, we don't get access and otherwise we just proceed and execute uh, that uh, critical section and then at some point in time we hopefully release uh, that uh, shared resource. Now we are using semaphore operations over here which in general can be used to grant a number of uh, accesses to a shared resource. We are using these semaphore operations only for the case where a single uh, thread is allowed to share that resource. So we are using so-called binary uh, semaphores and uh, this allows us to implement so-called mutexes, which means we are implementing mutual exclusion here. So we come to the conclusion that the imperative model of computation should be supported by mutual exclusion for critical sections. And also this has other far-reaching consequences. For example, if we think about uh, multi-cores, if we have multi-cores, we might have different caches. And uh, if uh, these caches have uh, copies uh, of shared uh, data, then we have to make sure that a certain write operation that's performed by uh, one processor is also seen uh, by the other processes. And this means that we have to implement cache coherency protocols, which for a large number of uh, cores may be very expensive. So the fact that we have to implement uh, mutual exclusion now uh, leads to the situation where we have a potential problem which so far existed only at the operating system level uh, and we po potentially have this also at the application level. That's the problem of uh, deadlocks. Uh, from the theory of operating systems it's known that uh, deadlocks can happen if four conditions are met. If we have uh, mutual exclusion, that means if a resource uh, uh, that cannot be used by more than one thread at a time exists. Uh, the second condition is the so-called uh, hold and wait condition. That means a thread already holding one resource may request a new uh, resource or more new resources. Uh, the third condition is the so-called uh, no preemption condition. Uh, this means that uh, resources cannot uh, forci forcibly removed from threads. Uh, they have to be released by these threads. And the fourth condition is the circular weight condition, which means that uh, two or more threads uh, do already uh, uh, are holding uh, resources and they are requesting new resources. And the dependencies between uh, these uh, resources, uh, between these threads are forming a cycle. So it's known also from the context of operating systems that uh, there is no really a good solution around that problem uh, because uh, techniques that prevent uh, deadlocks are usually uh, degrading the performance or, inc or are increasing the uh, resource requirements significantly so that therefore there are certainly systems out there uh, where it's accepted that in certain situations a deadlock could occur. That's okay if we don't have safety critical software, but for safety critical software that's obviously unacceptable. So therefore uh, we are inheriting this uh, problem there. And that means in, in order to kind of wrap up we have quite a number of problems with the use of imperative languages and shared memory. First of all, we have uh, this issue about the total order of the operations. In uh, practice, it would be from our point of view, from an application point of view, sufficient just to provide a partial order uh, reflecting the dependencies between the different operations. However, we are forced to use a total order there uh, and we cannot just use a partial order. Now, in order to actually app optimize an application at runtime, uh, what systems are internally doing in many cases is that they are trying to violate against this uh, total order and trying to come up with a different order uh, so that execution semantics is uh, still respected. So it would be nice to start with a partial order right away.
Also, we know that the preemptions that are feasible in most cases at runtime really complicate uh, the timing analysis because we don't know uh, how uh, long for how much time a processor will be taken away from, from threats. Also, we have seen that the access to shared memory is leading to uh, problems with respect to sharing of resources and we have to uh, prune certain behaviors away by uh, using, for example, semaphores. And we have seen that this in turn leads to deadlocks and uh, these deadlocks can uh, in some cases not really uh, be avoided unless we are willing to invest more resources. We will see uh, in chapter 4 uh, that uh, uh, the use of uh, protected resources is also leading to an effect called uh, priority inversion. And again, that has uh, far-reaching negative consequences on the design of software. And uh, another problem is that we know that for uh, general uh, pieces of uh, von Neumann code, uh, termination is undecidable. So that means that uh, we uh, cannot figure out whether a certain program will ever terminate. And even if it terminates, it, uh, it is uh, difficult to figure out whether we meet the timing specifications. It's already difficult to specify uh, the required timing, and it may be even more difficult uh, to provide uh, type uh, uh, upper bounds on the execution time. So we see all these problems. Nevertheless, uh, the use of von Neumann languages is widespread and we have to look at uh, what is used in practice and what we can do in order to reduce the potential problems here. So one particular language in this context that I would like uh, to mention is uh, uh, CSP. CSP is a language using synchronous message passing. Uh, CSP stands for Communicating uh, Sequential Processes, and it was uh, designed back in 1985 by Tony Hoare. So in the case of CSP, we have uh, uh, different uh, processes. They are communicating only uh, via uh, message passing. That means whether or not we have uh, shared memory is just an implementation point of view, but uh, the real uh, communication at the application level is using message passing only. And it's synchronous, and we have to commit to using a particular port. So if we would like to read uh, input information, we have to commit to using a particular input port. So that means we have this uh, kind of commitment that we have also seen for Khan process networks. And uh, very much in a similar way, uh, we are avoiding a non-determinate behavior over there uh, because we just have to wait until the input data is actually available. And uh, in this way, we avoid uh, the non-determinate behavior that could happen if uh, we would uh, select uh, an input from the first channel that is providing some input. So in that uh, sense, uh, CSP can serve as a good example on what, could be, uh, what can be achieved in this context. A second language which is also using synchronous message passing is ADA. Uh, ADA is uh, using so-called tasks, which uh, correspond uh, to the processes that we have used so far. And for a task, we can have uh, entries. These days, we would possibly call them the methods. And then we have synchronous uh, communication, which, however, syntactically is written in a rather asymmetric form. So in this example, we see uh, that we can wait for uh, some communication partner uh, to contact that particular uh, uh, task. Uh, and uh, this uh, contacting can be done by calling that particular uh, message from some communication partner. And we have synchronous uh, message passing. That means that these two partners will wait for each other. However, we don't have the same determinate behavior that we have seen for a CSP because in ADA we also have a so-called select statement, which means that we are waiting for uh, the first 
uh, accept the uh, uh, statement through which we can communicate. And that means depending on the speed of uh, the different communication partners that would possibly call our methods, we will either uh, first work on uh, this particular method or work on that other particular method. And it can really depend on the speed of our communication partners, which of these two messages, uh, which of these two methods is called first. And therefore, of course, uh, we will also have a different uh, uh, um, set of characters printed on, on the screen in this case. So a few words about uh, the general context of uh, ADA. Uh, the name ADA uh, was uh, chosen because it was said to be uh, the name of the first uh, female uh, programmer. Uh, ADA Lovelace was uh, said to be the first uh, female programmer. Uh, ADAR was uh, designed uh, as a result of a request by the uh, US Department of Defense, by the DOD, who wanted to avoid having multiple programming languages in their weapons. And therefore, they designed a set of requirements for such a programming language. And then there was a competition, and finally, a language was uh, chosen. And the language which was uh, chosen is based uh, syntactically on Pascal, and therefore the syntactic sugar looks very much like that of uh, Pascal. More recently, there was uh, an update of uh, ADA. There is now an object-oriented extension of the original ADA. Uh, and we have already seen that the task concept is a very essential concept in, in ADA. To give you an example there, we can see how we can use task in, in ADA. Uh, we see that there is a procedure. In this procedure, we can have a local task. Uh, the task body and the declarations of uh, these tasks are uh, described within that procedure. And then we assume that before we start the execution of uh, the body of the code belonging to that procedure, uh, we are starting these uh, tasks uh, A and B. So that is uh, uh, what the designers uh, put there into the language in order uh, to support the programming with uh, multiple uh, processes, which in this case uh, are coming in the form of tasks. So much about uh, ADA. Uh, other languages can also be used to communicate between the different processes. Uh, in many of the other languages, these uh, communication primitives are not built into the language itself, but they can be added by using libraries. So there are many communication libraries uh, which can uh, make uh, blocking or non-blocking communication available in von Neumann languages, and such libraries exist for C, C++, or Java. Some examples will be presented in Chapter 4. Now, for uh, historical reasons, I would also like uh, to mention two languages which were designed many years ago, which are sometimes forgotten, uh, but which can serve as a pretty good reference because they have some features that would be nice to have in more recent languages as well. Uh, the first of these is the rather old language called uh, Perl. Uh, Perl was designed in Germany for uh, process control, and initially there was a lot of hope that in this way uh, the cost of uh, uh, programming uh, the fabrication in large factories could be cut down significantly. And indeed, uh, uh, Perl was popular in Europe for quite some time. There is still uh, a so-called uh, Perl uh, website, uh, which essentially has been reused uh, uh, right now as a website for a specialist in the real-time domain. Uh, as a second uh, historic perspective, I'd like to point to a language called Chill. Uh, Chill was designed for the programming of uh, telephone exchange uh, stations. Uh, again, there was a need to, to have a good language for that. Uh, it was found that uh, Pascal, which was very popular in Europe at that time, uh, was not sufficient. So therefore, all the features which were missing in Pascal were added, and the result was then for, uh, called Chill. And it turns out that for historic reasons, uh, these uh, Chill implementations uh, have been used in telephone exchange uh, stations for quite some time. Now, in the context of imperative languages, I also have to talk about Java. 
uh, Java has some potential benefits for applications in embedded and cyber-physical systems. We know that uh, Java is a clean and safe language, so therefore it could be helping us to provide uh, reliability, dependability uh, for our cyber-physical systems. Also, we know that uh, multiple threads uh, could be a way of describing concurrency, so therefore the fact that uh, we have uh, multi-threading built into Java uh, could help us and we would possibly even avoid the operating system. Uh, if we talk about uh, embedded systems in the sense of uh, small mobile platforms, it does also help that uh, the uh, Java language is uh, platform independent, that implementations are platform independent. We just need to have uh, some kind of interpreting these Java programs on the particular platform. However, uh, after introducing this uh, short list of uh, potential benefits, I also have to mention this rather long list of uh, potential problems. First of all, uh, Java runtime libraries can be rather large, and this may be in contradiction to uh, the size of available memories in embedded systems. Uh, also, in embedded systems, it's very essential that we have access to special hardware features, which are intentionally prohibited in uh, Java implementations, but now we need to have access to special sensors and things like that, and somehow we have to find a way to implement that. Also, for Java, it's very essential that we have automatic garbage uh, collection, that this is not left to the user, and uh, therefore the garbage collector can be started at any time, which of course is not compatible with the requirements of a real-time system. And then the dispatcher uh, is uh, free to select any of uh, the uh, executable threads, and uh, that means that we are not really sure which uh, thread will be executed next in case there are multiple threads that could be executed. Then everybody knows this by experience that uh, Java can have uh, performance problems and uh, checking real-time constraints is very difficult because we have this to some extent non-deterministic behavior of the dispatcher. In order to address the requirements of different platforms in the embedded domain, uh, there are different Java editions. There is uh, a so-called Java Micro Edition, which has a much uh, smaller memory footprint than the Java Standard Edition. It does also have uh, less uh, features, and in turn, this uh, Java Standard Edition does have even uh, less features than the Java Enterprise Edition. So, but the availability of the micro edition allows us to use Java in devices where uh, memory is uh, 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 rather limited. Also, with respect to the underlying uh, execution uh, machines, we have uh, special uh, machines that allow us to execute Java in uh, devices that, that have uh, even less memory than the devices considered over here, than devices like, uh, like TVs and uh, devices like uh, smartphones. So by providing these uh, different editions and moreover providing also so-called so certain profiles, we are trying to address uh, the issues that uh, I just uh, mentioned, uh, but this doesn't really solve the real-time issue. So looking at the uh, different uh, languages that I presented over here, and looking at the general properties of uh, uh, imperative programs, we have seen that uh, programming with uh, threads can lead to some uh, uh, problems. And therefore, Edward Lee's conclusion in this context is that non-trivial software written with uh, threads, semaphores, and mutexes is incomprehensible uh, to humans, and uh, that uh, threads are widely non-deterministic. The programmer's job is to prune away non-determinism by imposing constraints on execution order like uh, mutexes, and the question is what to do about it. So therefore we see there are, there are certain problems, and it would be nice if we could get away from these problems. But nevertheless, using imperative languages is still uh, rather widespread uh, during the application development of embedded and cyber-physical systems. Uh, this concludes the first uh, section of uh, this uh, presentation. Now I'd 